Welcome back to Colony, the official podcast, and I'm your host, Tara Bennett, a senior producer for Sci-Fi Wire. So this week, we are tackling another big emotional episode, episode nine, The Big Empty, with two guys always running on a full tank, co-creator and executive <laughs> producer, Ryan Condal. That was, that was good. Thank you. That was sold, good. sold it with a face, too. I, I tried. Awesome. I tried. Yeah. The enthusiasm. Really? And well done. <laughs> executive producer, Wes Took. Hello, sir. Glad to be here. Thank you guys both for being here. Uh, I made them smile. That makes me happy. So, Wes Took, who is also a novelist, by the way, I yes, will point out. Yes, a novelist. He is a novelist. Um, that is a cue for who we have this week. We are beside ourselves happy to have back on the podcast the big empty director, Sarah Wayne Callies. Hello. Thank you for introducing me as a big empty director. That's the title of the episode, <laughs> not the way we refer to Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, have the cast Correct. referred to me too. There's a big empty director. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunate title. Excellent title. It is a very fine directorial debut. Congratulations on this episode. And you've been with us before. We talked about the first part of the season. But knowing at the beginning of the season that you had a desire to direct, you have obviously worked on so many wonderful TV shows as an actress. But when did it start to become a different skill set and that this was a different ambition for you? And how did it come to be this episode that you would direct? Well, you know, it wasn't something that really occurred to me that I could do until probably about halfway through season two. Mm. My head was full of all of the reasons I couldn't do it. I didn't go to film school. I didn't come up in the camera department. Uh, I'm just a girl, etc. And it's sort of a long story as to how I got there. But what was a really beautiful thing about how it came to be is that we're in an era right now where there's so many incredibly painful stories about the experiences of women in Hollywood mm -hmm. and the ways in which certain men in Hollywood have stood in their way and destroyed their souls, et cetera, that actually the story of me getting to direct, I think, is a beautiful counterpoint and a reminder to the ways in which we also lift one another up, right? Like, I'm entering a career as a woman filmmaker because the gang of straight white guys that I work for, when I went to them and said, hey, I'd like to do this, I have no experience. They went, great, well, let's help you get that experience and let's make this possible for you. And that's pretty extraordinary. And there's a tremendous amount of grace and faith involved in that that I am beyond grateful for. Josh was the first person that I talked to about it because, you know, as a friend for 12 years yeah. and a co-conspirator on this show and a leading man and executive producer, if, if he'd said no, it would have died right there. But what he said instead was, I will get your back, absolutely. And then it ended up being one of the most challenging acting episodes of the whole yes. series for him. And I was hopefully able to get his back. So it was, it was pretty great. You know, from Josh, I went to Ryan and then to Carlton. And they, you know, asked that I prepare through shadowing. So I spent my hiatus between seasons two and three shadowing several directors that I have tremendous respect for, one of whom was Jeremy Webb, who's directed on Colony. Brilliantly, he did episode five this season, which is, I think, one of the best we've ever done. And with that, tell me a little bit about what the process was for you guys. When you have an actor who's core to the show, it's a challenge to have someone of that importance who is an emotional through line and a backbone to what you're writing to be able to also do double duty with that. And so when you guys had that conversation, what was the process of getting everything that Sarah needed to be ready to do this? Sarah came to me in season two while we were making season two. Obviously, anybody that knows Sarah and has known her or heard her speak outside of her television roles, where she's obviously playing a character, <laughs> knows she's incredibly intelligent. She's well-read. She's literate. She's uh, very focused and determined. I mean, she dedicates much of her free time to helping people in these causes that she's very involved with. So she's somebody that throws herself into things. Mm -hmm. So when she came to me for this, she, was, she wasn't like saying, I want to direct the next episode. She was saying, I want to direct sometime. And I said, I think that's great. Throughout the course of the show, we've had a lot of people come to us, Wes and I and Carlton, asking to move up. Yes. And that's from Julia Cooperman, who is my assistant on the pilot, mm -hmm. who wrote episode eight and was a staff writer this year, worked her way up through the ranks. And it wasn't an immediate lift, but it was an ask that yes. she made. And when I interviewed her to be my assistant on the pilot, I remember yelling at her because she was leaving this really good job mm -hmm. to come be a guy's assistant who had never had an assistant before <laughs> on this, like, possibly already dead pilot <laughs> for a basic cable network. And I just, I didn't understand why she was doing it. And she said, well, I wanted to write one hour drama. Yeah. And Sarah came to me in the same way and said, like, I've done a lot of acting. I don't know that I want to do that for the rest of my career. I'm really interested in directing and I want to try to make that happen. So Wes and I and Carlton have always been supportive of trying to help people, you know, move up. It's the way we got to where we are. Somebody had to take a chance on you exactly. at some point. But then you have to ask them to do the work. And we immediately asked Sarah to do the preparatory work because acting in front of 
the camera is not anything. You learn the acting part of it, but there's so much more to directing. You're the CEO of the production yeah. for that episode, and you have to run all these departments and prep and all these things. So to her credit, she went off and really did it and dedicated herself to it. A lot of actors that end up directing episodes of television, I just know from stories, just kind of step into the director's yeah. seat and do it. And look, some of them are successful. Some of them just have it in them artistically. But Sarah not only ended up having that, but she also did the preparatory work to learn the job, which is why she's now doing the job not on Colony exactly. because it's led to other things for her. We were really impressed by that and appreciative of that. And we knew that she was going to be somebody that was going to kill herself to learn the process <laughs> and do the job. And she did. She really dedicated herself to it. It was incredibly collaborative with all of us and the production. And I mean, you've seen the episode. She did a great job. Absolutely. Well, it was really interesting also from a storytelling perspective because we, we knew ahead of time that this was going to happen and we kind of isolated the episode where we thought it, where Sarah's going to direct. It's such a challenge to direct for the first time in general, and to have to direct yourself is another challenge. And then there's also the prep requirements of being a director, which are very demanding and right. obviously fill an enormous amount of time. So we thought kind of early it would be very helpful potentially for Sarah to not appear heavily in the episode. Mm -hmm. And that shaped our thinking when we were in the early days concepting and outlining the season. And it ended up having this incredible story benefit, which is a lot of what plays out in the last couple episodes is based on the fact that Sarah's character is not around right. for a lot of these key events in episode nine. So it had this huge creative upside that we probably never would have gotten to, but we were trying to think about, you know, how practically to make this happen. Mm -hmm. That was Ryan. <laughs> and it was not me. That was well, an intern that's been fired. The great gift of me directing was that they got to get rid of me as an actor for a couple of episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's basically the way this is translating. Just one. <laughs> Thanks, Wes. I'm a novelist. It's subtext, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Not supposed exactly. to be spoken. <laughs> exactly. But as Ryan pointed out, I'm literate, so I read novels. <laughs> She's on to you. She's <laughs> and, got it. And I am very <laughs> into you. ice cream novelties. So we have that in common. <laughs> It all works. Crafty, it's writing, it's reading, it's all wonderful. So with your prep and with your shadowing, Sarah, what were some of the things that you really learned in that process that you brought in to your prep for this episode? You certainly had Tim Southam there as well as the rest of the first ADs and such, but what were some of the things that you knew you needed to, one, handle the production elements of it, but then number two, knowing that this was a very heavy character episode and that you were going to have super emotional heavy lifting? You mentioned Tim Southam, so just quick big shout out because he was my cut man and put me back together and was in my corner and is such an incredible champion. And this would not have been what it is without him. In the shadowing process, which introduced me to prep, directing is a three-act play. You've got prep, you've got shooting, and you've got post. And so shadowing was really my opportunity to sort of go to school and learn about the prep process. And what I think I saw in prep is that directing in a lot of ways is a little bit like raising a family, mm. which is that your job is not to tell people what to do. It's not to impose your ideas of what you think are right, but rather it's to sort of nurture each individual department so that they are willing to invest themselves and bring up their best ideas. Yeah. This is a team sport. <laughs> there's, no, uh, there's no one person who can do this alone, which is one of the things that I've always loved about acting and about storytelling on film, which is that we are so profound interdependent on one another, that it forms a kind of community that's really extraordinary. But, you know, while I was shadowing Jeremy, the one thing that he said that I go back to probably every day that I'm on a set, he's like, look, a show to a certain extent will shoot itself, mm -hmm. which is that if you call a rehearsal and you sit on your hands and do nothing, your DP will set up cameras, yeah. they will start lighting, they will get the actors into their costumes. Everybody is in charge of making sure it happens. There's one job that only a director can do, and that's talk to the actors. And Jeremy came up as an actor. He started that way. And it was the thing that gave me a certain level of confidence, which is that after 200 episodes of television as an actor, having worked with probably 150 directors, I've got a sense of maybe where some of those boundaries are mm -hmm. and the ways in which you can really support people and kind of lift them up and you know, when Josh is in a deep, dark place, like he had to be for this episode, there's a specific way of leaving him absolutely alone to do his really great work. And then of kind of stepping in with a gentle hand on his shoulder and going, hey, I want you to bite back the rage mm. in this one and see what happens to you. And I know as an actor, often when you have a director who comes from an acting background, there's a bit of a relaxation that yeah. can happen, which is that you know that someone's keeping an eye on your performance, not just did we say the words in the right order and is it in focus? And a compassion as an actor to an actor to get them there. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that everybody was very generous to provide with their time is I brought the cast in for rehearsal two weeks before we shoot. 
And that's not something that TV often affords the luxury mm. of doing. And especially when all of us have families and other obligations to spend four hours together in a room. This is an episode where you've got 18 pages of really emotional stuff that takes place in one very small space. And to have the time to get the material on its feet, say the words, listen to each other, and then just kind of let it marinate made a really big difference. And that rehearsal brought something partly in efficiency mm -hmm. as just a means of being humane to the performers on the day because this was difficult material, but also just in terms of making sure that we were really prepared as storytellers for how best to start to convey this work. It was super generous of everybody to give me that time. And I think it really paid off. It did. One of the remarkable things about this episode when you watch it with some distance is that those 18 pages could feel very repetitive emotionally. They mm -hmm. could hit the same beats. But Sarah worked so meticulously with the actors to make sure that, you know, finding the tonal variation so that you're not just hitting the same note over and over again, that there's a rhythm to it, a rise and a fall. And that's asking an enormous amount of any director and for Sarah to come out in her first experience. And it wasn't that we had to play with it in editing. Mm -hmm. It was all there. It was all shot and acted and put together in a way that was really accomplished. Yeah, and covered really well, too, yeah. so that we were able to retell the story. You tell the story on the page once in a two-dimensional space, but then once it exists in a three-dimensional space and you're doing full coverage of the room, you get to retell the story in a way that adds another dimension to it. Having Tori ask Peter a question or Broussard ask Snyder a question, but seeing the question asked through Josh's POV, right. which isn't necessarily written on the page, or seeing the question asked through Amy's POV, who's the newcomer to this and doesn't know all the history that's, that's kind of throbbing underneath yeah, everything in that, with this in that yeah. horrible basement room. Yeah, and finding so many of those shots, you know, the shot at the end of the episode of Snyder walking alone down the hallway. We mm -hmm. never stand shots that long. Right. But I remember seeing Sarah sit up in the day and just <laughs> realizing how great it was. And we were shooting incredibly long hours in a hotel at that point. And, mm -hmm. you know, it felt like time was precious. But then you saw the shot and you realized, oh, this is totally worth it. And that's a director's eye. And that usually comes with a lot of experience. So we were very impressed. Well, let's talk about the overall structure with this one, just because at the very beginning, you've got a clever cold open where we go back and we show that guy, David, who in the previous episode really, you know, he was the briefcase guy. But now we get a little bit of perspective on who he is, that he works for Kynes, what his role is with him. What was important about us seeing a different point of view of what happened with that attack that happened in the previous episode and then also tonally how it kind of sets up? I mean, part of it is a tragic irony. You just see in the previous episode, he's a target yeah. and he's killed and you get the case. But when you go into his life, first of all, you humanize him, but also you come to realize that in his death, you lost this immense potential to uncover an incredible number of secrets, that he had access yeah. to all sorts of interesting things. And it's also, we just love to shift the POV of filmmaking in general. We very rarely have the chance to do it outside of our core main characters because we've always limited ourselves to those points of view, except right. for the teasers. So here's an opportunity to open up the world and show someone else's life and peek behind that curtain in a way that we would never be able to do in the main body of the episode. But it had been a while since Broussard had killed somebody, so he was really itching. <laughs> Tori gets really yeah. testy Tori when gets he has yeah. murdered Super in yeah. the Low death count. Wes and I were talking about this on a day. In a way, the question of the teaser is what does it feel like to be killed by Eric Broussard, right? So you're right. with this guy the whole time, yeah. and then you just sort of see this race rise up into the frame. I love our teasers. Our teasers are always, I think, one of my favorite parts of the show, partly because Day off for me by and large, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. But they're also just they're incredible world building, you know, and I, I just think it's such a smart way to introduce the show. Yeah, I mean, we uh, cribbed that a little bit from this little show called Breaking Bad, which uh, What's that? Uh, Wes is very unfamiliar with. It was the spinoff from Better Call Saul. <laughs> oh, uh, I like that show. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah. But we, uh, we've always used those as a way to open up the world. Colony is this huge science fiction world, but it's told through this very tight POV structure. So those little out-of-world teasers have always been a way to really open it up and show people what's going on. And in a place where we don't have a Westworld budget, to open these little windows into the big world outside in a way that makes the world feel big, mm -hmm. but doesn't put a huge burden beyond what the show can handle. We've tried to challenge ourselves now that we're in season three, like, how do we continue topping ourselves and exploiting this methodology? And it was just, I forget how it exactly came up in the room, but there was a, just a really interesting discussion that arose about telling the story that we've already seen from a different point of view and what's it like to be a victimized by Broussard. And uh, we were really, you know, really intrigued about it. And it created an incredible production challenge because we shot that scene all as one big scene. So you're shooting episode eight, yeah. but you're really covering stuff for episode nine. It's two directors, Darren Serafian. Sarah's making sure she's getting the stuff from Chavo point of view, mm -hmm. the guy in the car, Darren is shooting totally Broussard POV. So you notice if you go back and watch that scene in episode eight, you're always in Broussard's POV. You're never inside the car. Right. Whereas episode nine, the teaser nine, you're always 
inside the car. You don't see Broussard until Javor sees Broussard, which is the soprano moment, the yes. moment right before the everything yeah. goes black. Um, incredibly cool side by side, but ultimately was three plus days, I think, of horrible nights mm-hmm. in that freezing alley that cool. <laughs> in downtown Vancouver. But, you know, came out really well, but it was three days out of the colony schedule. That's a big... That's a big chunk. That's a huge chunk Absolutely. of time. And that's another production challenge for Sarah. We didn't just hand a clean eight days on yeah, this episode. Yeah, that's true. You know, there's a handover. There's this, and then, you know, the camp scenes were also block shot with other episodes. So the negotiation of having to come in and work with another director and make sure right. you get yeah. your stuff. The refugee and, camp. Yeah, yeah, the refugee camp. Yeah. I will say Darren was amazing about that. For somebody with his experience, he was so collaborative. He was like, well, let's just write down some shot lists and figure out what you need. And if there's anything that you want me to cover that you run out of time, like he was so, you wouldn't have blamed him if he'd sort of walked in and gone, listen, I've been doing this forever and I've got 7,000 episodes of television under my belt. So I'm going to shoot this and then we'll pull what you need for yours. He was so collaborative. It was really, really beautiful. It was great fun too. I mean, just a big kind of movie scale action sequence yeah. with all these little pieces blowing out the tires. And we'll always be delighted by the, uh, the take that's actually in the show of the Range Rover crashing yeah. into what looks like the dumpster is actually the Range Rover crashing into the wall of the alley because in that shot, the driver, it was Ooh. like the 10th time doing it and he got a little, <laughs> the Icarus flew a little close to the sun. Whoops. He had a real bad day. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just rammed that Range Rover right into the wall. But the reaction that you get from the actors inside the car is, holy shit, we just hit something. <laughs> and it was so good that it's, it's, in, it's in the, the final take. cut. So That's yeah, he, the take. he busted up that Range Rover pretty good. <laughs> Worth it. Yeah. We bought a Range Rover. You just, you <laughs> Heard the, yes, exactly. You heard the disappointed squawk over the PA mics where it was just like, they crashed the car. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then it was a whole, like, picking up taillight glass. It was, oh, it was great. It was just movie making. It was awesome. It was also so cold. Carlos, who wrote the episode, Carlos Rios, who just did a really brilliant job, he showed up the first day and was there for, like, a couple of hours just shaking from head to toe because he's, you know, he's rail thin. And every time I saw him show up on set for the next three days, he had on another article of clothing. <laughs> yeah. like, it started with, like, he went out and he bought a poncho and then he had a hat on and then he had gloves and he had, like, a muffler and there was, like, a balaclava moment. It was really funny. <laughs> Carlos is from Philadelphia. He he really should have known better. He should I feel know like, better. <laughs> I feel like it did prep him for, like, that's the reason he didn't die in that alley like a lot of California people would have. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yes. yeah he definitely has a little bit, of, we got a little meat on we bones. Took, we yeah, took Carlos okay. shopping to the uh, Canadian REI. Plied him with cheesesteaks to pump him back up. Correct, correct. Throw him back out there, yeah. yeah. When we move on, we've got really the big impetus of this is that when we see that Snyder hangs around, and that really sets up the machinations that happen, the Will Broussard prep, Amy, everybody is getting into position. And surprise, Bram is part of all of this too, which is a wonderful reveal, basically the kidnapping of Snyder. So uh, talk a little bit about how you wanted to reveal that. It was a great moment. It was one where I went, oh, hey, hey, I didn't see that coming. I mean, in a lot of ways, once we got to Seattle, once episode six was kind of out of the way, you know, we talked about the first act of the season ending with episode five and Charlie's death. After that episode, all roads led to here. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of preparatory planning and we're all looking towards episode nine, knowing that Will was going to blame Snyder for the death of his son and they were going to cross paths in Seattle. And Mm -hmm. how do we lay all the track for that in a way that feels organic and earned? One of the ideas that we really liked was the character turn for Will to be in such a dark place that he actually involves his eldest son in this really twisted revenge plot against Snyder and that Bram goes along and that we reveal this is probably the reason that he joined the community patrol in the first place. Mm -hmm. Those beats that we see in episodes seven and eight, they're all all these off-screen conversations going on that we're not seeing between Will and Bram and they're conspiring to make this happen and Will got Bram into the community patrol because he's convinced that there's something going on in Seattle and then once Snyder shows up oh, now here's a way to exploit it. So, yeah, I mean, we wanted the episode to be a series of surprises, I think, uh, character-driven surprises, and that was a big one. You know, we saw it really as a heist episode, and that's why that first act plays out the way it does, and rhythmically it feels different than a Colony episode. You have the piece of score tying all these sequences together, just not really a style choice that we usually use, but for this episode it felt right to build this tension and excitement and suspense and then to lead us into, like, a play in one room. It's like a Mm two-hander, yeah. The question behind that question also has to do with the time jump we had this season, which some people have been talking about in the Twitters. It's a, There's a, no continuity in the show, Wes. <laughs> it was an unusual choice in that typically large time jumps happen in the off season. Yeah. And we're asking a lot of the audience to do a lot of the character math. And you certainly ask yourself creatively, are we cheating it by jumping forward? 
Episode six was such an interesting poem about grief, but we didn't want to spend the next three episodes right. in the immediate aftermath of that event, which is one of the original reasons for time jumping. But you're asking a lot of your audience, as we said, to fill in the math and to realize that over the course of these months, a lot of interesting things have been happening. And it's mm -hmm. a different type of viewing. Like We're asking you to fill in a lot of blanks. Right. And that has its challenges. And it's also a different storytelling modality than Colony typically falls into, where you're kind of along for the ride and you're questioning things as they happen, but we're not asking you to do an enormous amount of People who are asking, this is not a character I recognize. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Something has happened in the six months, the way they're processing it, and it's for you to decipher why they're acting the way they're acting. And the Bram thing is a huge, you know, we don't have character twists like this where someone generally shows up like it, you know, just walks into a plot point. But for us, it's like when he shows up, you suddenly can look back at all the choices he's been making and recontextualize them. Absolutely. And not just the plot choice of, I'm going to go to the police station and sign up for the community patrol, but also the ways in which he's trying to take control of his sister or be yeah. more present in her life. That there are character things that are, if Will went to him and asked him these things, is he reading something in Will and the danger that is leading him to make these other choices too? And some things that he maybe wanted to see out of his father. Precisely. You know? Let's talk about the interrogation portion because it really does unfold in three stages. Tell me a little bit, Sarah, about the conversations that three of you guys had. Well, I'll start with a conversation that we didn't have, which revealed itself to me in an interesting way. We were covering the scene where Broussard is interrogating Snyder first. And I started most of these scenes on the close coverage mm -hmm. so that as the emotions were at their rawest and in some ways their least practiced, we would capture that and then we would move out to the wides, particularly just as people got exhausted, because especially for Peter, this is an incredibly physically demanding episode. So we started in the closer coverage. Once we got that, I went into the actors and said, okay, great, you know, now we're going to set up specifically for the flap between Broussard and Snyder. And Peter looked up at me, sort of horrified. He goes, how many more times is he going to hit me? And I looked to Tori. I said, Tori, have you been hitting Peter? <laughs> and Tori put on his best, I didn't do it, mom. Babe. <laughs> and he goes, he told me to. And I looked at Peter and Peter goes, okay, yeah, I did. I said, actually hit me, but I, I didn't, I thought we were covering it. And I was like, these are conversations you share with your director. So poor Peter was taking an open-handed smack Ooh. from Tori, who is a pretty strong guy, like probably 10 or 15 times. And God love him. He kept doing it another couple of times. And I'm sitting here going, I'm going to be responsible for Peter Jacobson breaking his jaw. And this is going to be tricky for the rest of us. But when you actually hit someone, it's far less dramatic than when you stage hit them. Mm. So the hit that we ended up using is actually a stage smack because it read better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And it broke my heart. The moment of looking at Peter going, what do you mean you told Tori to hit you? Like, what is wrong with you? You are such an amazing actor. And look at that guy. So that was a conversation we didn't have. Uh, <laughs> God bless him. Actually, on that note, we did have Peter Jacobson here with us before, and he talked about shooting that super intense sequence. The physicality with you and Josh and a toilet <laughs> looked really uncomfortable. Tell us about it. Well, like I said, with the romance thing in episode six, I was sort of hoping for my boudoir moment. I had also asked whether or not there was any way to get a scene for me and Josh in the toilet. I have been asking that since the second season. And uh, so thank you to uh, Ryan and Wes for accommodating me on that. And as Tim Southam said, reasonably clean water. <laughs> reasonably clean. Peter was guaranteed reasonably clean water for that scene. He did not look it. I'll the tell you that. The problem was my ability to breathe in the toilet. It was a wonderful contraption. And the rehearsal we did, we did with clear water. Okay. So I could see where I was meant to put my face so I could continue to breathe. When we shot it, there was brown water and I couldn't see. And there was one moment actually when I was unable to get my breath and I gave the signal to the AD that we had worked on before that mm -hmm. I couldn't breathe and we need to cut the scene. And I gave the signal and for whatever reason, the signal was not seen or I gave it wrong. There was a moment there of actual panic when I had to wrestle Josh out of the toilet oh my God. <laughs> the toilet bowl. And he at some moment knew that I was really trying to get out. Uh, I was fine. I was never in any danger. It was just I had this little panicky moment and I had some nightmares for a few uh, weeks afterwards where I was a little just, just a little too close to Josh. And um, mm. that was one of the uh, problems with that. But uh, I didn't ask for workman's comp, so it's all good. Um, that was a very... Uh, Josh a changed very... the signal and paid off the crew. <laughs> Safe I feel word like, is wrong. I feel like now with us 3,000 miles apart, I, I, can, I can tell you the I truth behind that. I knew it. Peter came after us on that pretty hard, by the way. Yeah. They were really upset. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're not allowed to use the tag at the end of the episode anymore about not harming. 
um, there were so many great moments shooting that episode. I even forgot the question, Tara. I'm sorry. Oh, just in terms of, you know, how you guys discussed it, it was, um, again, we're never 100% sure how much Snyder is actually telling or allow him to, himself to be emotionally right. <laughs> present with anybody, right. especially the Bowmans. But the back and forth is so intense and so well blocked. For me, as far as Snyder's motives in that scene, I mean, this is a life and death moment where he has to absolutely be convincing this man of the truth of what he's saying. Mm-hmm. And as an actor, it's not difficult to play that. Uh, the joy of that episode and that scene, which we actually w- was shot over a couple of days, was that, I mean, Sarah is just a phenomenal director. And the three of us know each other so well after this amount of time together as actors. So to have a director who knows you as an actor that well, that kind of intimacy between the three of us, it was just a very easy flow of ideas and very intense discussions, almost sort of second nature, knowing what we didn't have to discuss, what was important technically, obviously, so I didn't drown, which almost happened. And uh, there was just something so intimate about it. And uh, Sarah, just after talking long and hard about it, she just let us go. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was exhausting because we really needed to do it a bunch of times. But uh, Josh and I would sort of retreat to our corners and get ourselves prepared in whatever way. And, you know, from my angle, I mean, every time the camera rolled and I was back on that toilet with my hands behind my back, just to see Josh's face, he's just so phenomenal. He was just there yeah. and fully, deeply there. And that's all you can ask for as an actor is to have your partner be there because it doesn't matter where you are because if you're really listening and really doing your job, which is to listen and to react, he's going to take me wherever I need to go. And so I just appreciate the depth of Josh's commitment and his just pure talent and willingness to go as deep as he possibly can. The only real problem, other than almost drowning, was uh, that Josh would, you know, he's a big, strong man. I am too, but not quite as much. (laughs) And I would lean back. I couldn't support myself with my hands back behind the toilet. So I I was dependent on Josh sort of pushing me, but holding me. And um, at one point he grabbed my shirt. Well, this is after also digging the barrel of a gun into my forehead several times, which does hurt after a while. But he would grab my shirt to sort of support me so I didn't fall out of frame behind the toilet. And at one point, he just grabbed a little too much chest hair and just yanked it out. And this was, he got a handful. Um, I mean, it was splattered inside the shirt, but I knew. And and all I could think the whole rest of the scene was, I might look like I'm crying, but it's only really because I have just lost one third of the hairs (laughs) on my chest. And that is a painful experience. The stallion, wounded. Yes, if you want to know why, if you want to know why Peter is called the stallion, and he's really telling you. I mean, the days in that room were incredibly intense. The reason that um, we discussed this a couple episodes ago, why he doesn't take Ryan out to dinner, is that Ryan was on set the day that Tori was supposed to slap him. Oh, and he, bitch slap, yes. He bitch slapped him, and then Ryan said from the monitors it didn't look real. No. And then Tori slapped him oh, again no, and said, Ryan. doesn't look that real. Lame. <laughs> and he just took it. Tori's not a small man either. I mean, I think no. that... Uh, no. Yeah. Strong, firm grip. Very firm grip. A lot of top spin. Yeah. Yeah. We so appreciate the physicality and the uh, literal, Gotta get it right. Gotta literal get dents right. and bruises, Peter, that you have taken to bring this authenticity to the role. What I do. What I do. What the stallion does. Any specific visual references, films that you were trying to get the spirit of in this kind of sequence? Um, I mean, there were a lot of references that we watched for this. There was a lot of Michael Mann stuff. Mm. But I think, not to sound too green, but... For all the things that you watch and you put in your head, I think it can be dangerous, or maybe just as a new director, to then try and recreate that. Yeah. So at a certain point, I stopped watching anything, and I just started reading the script over and over and over and over and over, because my job isn't to make a Michael Mann movie. My job is to tell the story that's on the page. Right. And what it seemed to me was that they're very radically different scenes. One is a trained operative interrogating someone in order to get information. Another one is a compassionate doctor choosing to leave somebody to be tortured and killed. Yeah. Another is a man desperately trying to quench the flames of his own self-hatred and guilt through torturing and killing another person. And then another one is a son's attempt to understand his father's choices. 
those are completely different scenes. And the fact that they happen with many of the same characters in the same space is almost irrelevant mm. because in a way they're sort of four short films. Yeah. You know, this is the story of Broussard's interrogation. This is the story of Amy abandoning a man to be killed. This is the story of Will trying to come to terms with himself. And this is the story of Bram trying to understand why all the fucking adults in his life are idiots <laughs> who constantly keep making terrible decisions. Yeah. He did blow up a spaceship. He did blow up a spaceship. <laughs> He did, but like Bram basically is the only person who has successfully accomplished anything, right? And Colony, like, true. <laughs> that was the log line of Colony. <laughs> Teenage boy overcomes hurdles presented by his family in order to become yeah. resistance hero. Te- teenage yeah. boy exactly. overcomes enough parents to become resistance hero. Yeah. Completely. And, you know, I mean, that's also like this is a character thing, not a director thing, but there is also an unbelievable amount of betrayal of Katie that goes on in episode nine. It's one thing that the only friend I have in the world is back in town and not reaching out to me in the darkest part of my life. It's another one that my husband is running off behind my back and trying to kill people. It's a far different one that my one remaining surviving son is being roped into something lethal by two grown men who ought to know better. Right. That propels, I think, a lot of the rest of the season for her. And Snyder didn't even reach out either. I mean, really. How everybody rude. kind of let Katie down. <laughs> I know. You guys had that thing. You didn't call. You didn't send flowers. Nope. Nope. You were nice to him, actually. <laughs> Not even a text. He... I have a phone now. That's true. <laughs> Basically, by the end of the season, the only person that Katie likes is Amy. <laughs> She's like, you know what? Amy and Gracie are the only two same yeah. people in my life right now. The rest of y'all can go to hell. <laughs> Um, where is Snyder now with his family? Is he absolved now in Will's eyes? Is he still a good person at all (laughs) because he has decided not to give them up? I wouldn't presume that it's not self-interest. I mean, they have a (laughs) tape of the man spilling state secrets. So, yeah. Well, I think there is something to be said, though, not to sort of dig too deep into it, but I got an email from my mom this morning after she watched episode eight. And she was talking about how chilling it is to watch scenes of families at a refugee camp at a moment Mm. in our culture when that's all we're talking about. And I think there's something really worthwhile in exploring the story that punishing your enemies doesn't heal you. (laughs) And not that this is the story of the apotheosis of Will Bowman, but I do think there's something very valuable in the catharsis that it might have given Will or even an audience to go, yeah, the bad guy, Mm -hmm. screw him. I think we're living in a culture where we're seeing that that doesn't help. And so to be telling a story where a man really looks down the barrel fully of what it means to take another human life, not out of self-defense and not even to protect another human being, but as nothing but vigilante justice for a crime that, quite frankly, hasn't even been proven. Because Snyder does make an interesting point, which is that if the IGA hadn't arrived, Charlie might have survived, Mm -hmm. but certainly Will, Katie and Bram would be in the ground. And who knows what would have become of Charlie and Gracie? Probably nothing wonderful. And so this is a show I've always been incredibly proud of because saying something like that at this moment in our culture has value. You know, letting him go doesn't heal Will either. And I think the rest of the season, what's been done with Will is really brilliant because it's it's not like, whew, glad I got that out of my system. Katie, let's go have dinner. Like, (laughs) exactly. Yeah, let's go to the beach. Exactly, you know. But instead, grief and healing is a long, ugly, brutal tender process. Right. And there's only one way to do that, and that's to do it. That leads to the segue for the end of the episode, which I thought was really brilliant. Katie comes back into the house and Will is there broken and crying. And uh, a lot of shows would have dialogue in that moment. There'd be this hug out between the wife and husband. And instead, there's just that beautiful, heartbreaking silence and the framing of that scene that they are not in the same space with each other, that Katie is observing what she doesn't know has gone down, but certainly knows what this is about. He has not let her in to see any of this since Charlie died. Talk about the writing of that and then the framing of it in the moment and Sarah about you both playing that. That was always envisioned as the end point of the episode. When we break the seasons, we always talk about the main story arc. What are the things that we want to do this season? And then we talk about the individual character arcs and how they serve that story. But one of the arcs that we always talk about is the relationship arc of the Bowmans. Mm -hmm. And that's always something that we've had to keep alive and fresh so that it doesn't feel like we're getting stagnant. 
Last season, we saw the Bowmans come back together as, as a result of the pressures around them. And in episode 13 of season two, they're closer than they ever have been in the whole series. This season was very much about exploring that for the first couple of episodes and then blowing it apart and wondering whether these two could ever come back together again. So as we move into the final act of the season for episode 10 and beyond, we were setting up this thing that they haven't talked about, they haven't explored at all, mm-hmm. and they don't even talk about in the scene, although we understand that there's a lot passing between them in that moment. Now they've at least set the table to set up the resolution of this part of the story. We don't know how that's going to go, mm-hmm. but at least the ice has been broken. We've right. gone from that really chilling scene, I think, in episode seven where Will comes into the house and he just passes, passes Katie without even looking mm-hmm. in her direction. Now we've come to this. Will's lying broken on the living room floor and he's staring at Katie and he's obviously come to the end of his rope and something horrible has happened. And she's there listening. Mm-hmm. And we will see how that develops from there and where that takes them. But that was always the idea. This was the end of the second act of the season and now is going to lead us into the final act of season three. I said to the guys earlier in the podcast season, your moment in five when you see Charlie killed shoots through the viewer like a, an emotional bolt. And then watching Josh cry <laughs> is, is really undoing as an audience member. Well, we sent a PA in to tell Josh that he wasn't going to be able to go fly fishing that weekend. <laughs> So, so it came from a real place. That scene is incredibly oh, pain. That's amazing. Yeah. After we extinguished the fires in the trailer, we were able to lead him towards set. <laughs> right. Right. To sadness. Yeah. We Such just a... put little drops of bourbon on the pavement, and he slowly <laughs> yeah. walked into the set. Yeah. yeah. Then we just sent Sarah in. Oh <laughs> Go to it. And roll. <laughs> I mean, look, I, you know, Josh and I have been married to other people for collectively over 35 years. And so I think, in a way, all the preparation for that is, this is your life. But it's also like when you stand there and you say in sickness and in health, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, you don't always know what that means. But it means that, right? It means that even when I don't understand you, even when you've hurt me, even when I'm so far down my own rabbit hole that I can't see the light anymore, even when I can't save you, I will sit with you Mm. and I will hold a space you know, they can't save each other. But I think in that moment, Katie can at least guard the door and keep the demons at bay long enough for him to have his moment to do whatever he needs to do inside. I've always loved Katie and Will's marriage because it feels honest. Yeah. And that moment, it's not resolution. It's just being present. And the fact that Will has chosen to be present with her, to not leave like he has been, You know, I think we can kind of create a a fantasy for ourselves that when we protect the people that we love from what we're going through, we're doing them a service. Right. But I think this part of the story is about how what we do is we compound their pain when we hide ourselves from the people that we love, because then they're not only concerned for us, but they're bereft of us as well. And so that moment of grace for him to just be there with it, I think, is really profound. And if that's all he has to offer, and if just sitting there is all she has to offer, then at least for that moment, that's enough. It is. Thank you so much for being with us, Sarah, and talking about this episode and giving insight into what your process was. It's my pleasure. Thank you for your time. One final shout out of gratitude for Ryan and Wes and everybody else to have given me this episode to do. I know it makes sense because there's not a lot of action and special effects. And so in some ways it's more straightforward, but you know, it's also a really extraordinary thing for them to have trusted me with an episode with this much kind of heart and emotional power. So thank you guys for that because it was just sheer magic to be able to be there and watch all of these people that I love so much do this incredible work. And I'm super, super, super proud of them. You should be. (laughs) Remember us when we're unemployed, Sarah. Just remember this all. Thank you. I'll always hire you too. Thank you. For novels. (laughs) And ice cream novelty. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Sarah. I love you, dog. I'll see you soon. And thank you so much, Ryan and Wes, for being here with us and explaining this great episode. And uh, we will get back together and do it again next week. All right. And as always, I would love to thank my wonderful podcast team, producer Bartley Taylor, producer editor Paul Terry, our mixer and master Dave Draper, and for LA Digital Recording for being our home this week. As always, if you are enjoying the show, please give us a review and subscribe on iTunes. Great ratings on that service helps Colony's profile in general. We also want more of your questions for our listener mail segments. Leave them for me via the comment section at the bottom of every weekly podcast post on Sci-Fi Wire, or just reach out to me on Twitter with questions via my handle at Tara D. Bennett or hashtag Colony Podcast. Thanks, and we'll be back next week. 